uh, Nicole's needs. So, in other words, Nicole had a really excellent preparation before she even started the job. As for James, he says, well, look, actually, I, I, know where I'm, you know, I know where I'm going tomorrow. I know where the office is, but otherwise, I know nothing about this job other than the fact that I'm not being paid very much. So they say, well, that's fine, no problem. But Nicole says, that's okay, um, you know, because it looks, like, it looks like, if nothing else, you're going the same sort of area as me. We're both going off into Hove. I've got to, uh, and uh, I can give you a lift to, uh, you know, to your job in the, in the morning. And so, hey, presto, uh, the next day, Nicole gives uh, James a lift off to work, and they, all right, so they've got to know each other a little bit. So later on that day, in the evening, they decide, let's, let's have dinner together back in the hotel. So, you know, they're sitting having dinner, and, and, and uh, Nicole is uh, wondering what wine they need to have for, with, with uh, dinner, and James is saying, I don't, I don't know anything about wine, but uh, I'd like to prefer a beer, and all this sort of chit-chat goes on. But they get to talk about what's been happening on that first day of their new jobs. And James says, it was terrible. When I arrived at my, uh, at this insurance company, they had absolutely nothing prepared for me at all. They just sort of, they, they were so desperate, they just sat me down to the desk and said, here, look, read the annual report. This will tell you something about the company. And, you know, uh, and then when they finally found someone that uh, James could sit with, he found that he had no, he couldn't interpret what was going on. This person who was, you know, handling, doing claims conversations on the telephone uh, had no idea what they were talking about. It was all just a, a complete disaster, really. So in the end, they said, well, look, uh, we've got some, uh, some stuff that, uh, that, that we can sit you down to do, which is called uh, e-learning. And uh, James said, I've never heard of that before, but uh, I'll have a go at that. And, uh, you know, James finds that he's sat there on his own for hours with this e-learning and that uh, he seems to be absolutely, they're throwing information at him about insurance at a fantastic rate. And then uh, not, only, uh, not only that, but at the end, he has this enormous great quiz that he has to answer. I don't know if we've got a picture of it. I think we might have actually. Yeah, well, this is his introduction to insurance and the reading he has to do. And there's this, you know, this enormous quiz, a pass mark of 100%. It's a bit of an exaggeration. But, uh, you know, all sort of questions about superficial stuff, which he doesn't really need to know. He could always look up if he needed to, in, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on some sort of reference source. So... Um, Nicole, he says to, you know, to Nicole, did you, did you have to do this, you know, this e-learning stuff? You know, uh, isn't it awful? It's horrible. And Nicole says, well, actually, uh, not, not all e-learning is horrible because um, when we uh, you know, all got together at, uh, with the other trainees at Laveau in the head office and we started our program, we spent the day, you know, obviously not just getting to know each other, but we, we had these really challenging sort of interactive scenarios that we worked through as a group. Um, which were really exciting, but they've also got a whole load more that we can, uh, you know, access on our iPads or laptops, and uh, that will, uh, you know, um, mean that we can get lots of insights into different situations that might occur in our jobs in retail management, and uh, not only can we discuss them together, but we can work on them individually, and in fact, it was a really, uh, you know, Nicole said she'd had a really good experience, and it was obviously uh, a lot of fun. Well, anyway, this goes on, but there's, a, there's two stories here. There's a story about blended learning. As you probably gather, there's a story about Nicole and James. And this is all in your imagination. But Nicole does say, look, you know, um, yeah, James says, uh, what, how are you planning to spend the rest of the evening? And she says, uh, well, you know, I've got to redress my work-life balance, so I'm not going to do any more, any more study of interactive scenarios. Would you like to come back to my room and empty my minibar with me? And James says... Uh, uh, and she said, bring your pictures with you, bring your portfolio with you, I want to see all the pictures you've got. And anyway, James yeah, needed an awful lot of arm twisting, but eventually he did, he did say, yes, oh, if you really insist, I'm going to do this. Now, anything else that happens is entirely in your imagination. But uh, anyway, we move on. And throughout the week, they do compare notes regularly about the various training programs that they're doing. They get out and about. There you can see how horrible and windy and cold it is down on Brighton Seafront, but that's okay. They still manage to wrap up warm and get out there. And they, and, and they spend the week comparing notes. But as it gets towards, this is now Thursday, and it's nearing the end of the week, um, Nicole says, well, look, over the, over the last week I've been, as you know, I've been, she said to James, I've been working up at our Gatwick store and uh, shadowing for the last three days the manager there you know, to, to, to uh, get a little bit of insight into how, uh, you know, the retail environment works in practice. And James says, well, 
you know, I've just been sort of fending for myself largely this week, except for a three-hour PowerPoint presentation I had to sit through, which the local trainer came down and did. Um, and uh, it's not going too well. But what Nicole says is a bit of a surprise. She says, look, uh, as of next week, I'm going back to Paris, and I've got a, a three-month uh, secondment to the, our par flagship store in Paris. And uh, would you like to come back with me? You know, forget, you know, this job is obviously not working out for you but this is going to be uh, great for me. And, uh, the, you know, James says, he's, he's thinking about it here, as you can see, and James sort of says, I can't see it. Look, this is, you know, I don't speak French. Look, I, She says, look, you're a fantastic illustrator. I don't know what you're like at insurance claims, but you're a fantastic illustrator. And, you know, you could try and establish a career for yourself in Paris. You could probably find an outlet in the fashion industry. But he says, look, I don't really see it. I don't see that as, as, as working out. But anyway, let's go back, uh, go back to the hotel and have some dinner. Bit of a quandary for James, I think. So next, next day, Nicole is sitting in the car. She's just packed her bags in. And she's selecting on her iPad a podcast series, one of a series of podcasts which LeBeau have produced for her that she can, uh, you know, wear various members of the management of LeBeau talk about aspects of working in their particular world. And she's selecting that. She's putting that down on the seat, on the seat uh, beside her. Um, she's selecting the podcast. But out, you know, and then out of the blue, who turns up? But, um, but James sticks his bag in the back of the car and says, change my mind, I'm coming. I'm going to come with you. I'm going to, you know, let's see what happens. Let's do something new. And uh, anyway, so they, uh, they chat in the car, and um, James says, look, you know, I've had a look at your, on your iPad where you're playing this podcast. It, it's, it, it talks, you know, it's, it's got your name at the top, and it says you're on the trainee manager program. It sounds really posh, and it looks like, it looks like it's all ahead of you, and it's going to be a fantastic experience. She says, well, I, I'm feeling really good about it because over the next few months, not only do I have a chance to work at the uh, flagship store in Paris and, and really apply what I've learned, but, you know, I'm, I maintain my relationship with that trainee group. We're going to be um, communicating together again online as a group and maintaining that relationship and spreading it out with other people in the uh, organization. And uh, they've applied, uh, they've uh, provided me with a mentor because over that period, I'm going to obviously have a lot of experiences and I want to uh, gain the maximum benefit from it. So let, uh, that's somebody I, can, uh, somebody I can relate to other than the manager of the store where I'm going. And uh, anyway, it all, look, it all looks very good. James says, well, I had, I had nothing of that. So I've, let, I've left my job. I haven't told them yet, but I'm not going back. I'm going come, come to uh, come with you to Paris, and let's see what happens. So it's a happy ending in a way, but we don't, we, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens ultimately. Let's try and sort of, off they go, and they're driving off. Now, all of, uh, while they are driving off in the car, um, Nicole has a song playing on the, uh, on the radio of her car. And uh, a song by this woman. Who is this woman? <coughs> Edith Piaf. Edith Piaf, yeah, absolutely. And Edith Piaf is particularly famous for one song. What's that? Je ne regrette rien. Yeah, non, je ne regrette rien. And uh, you might say, what is earth, as, uh, on earth has this got to do with blended learning or uh, James and Nicole's story? Well, yes, her, 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 her song was playing on the car as they as they drove off. But in a way, um, you know, there's a, a couple of ways where this is highly relevant to the experience. One is that um, you know, uh, we hope that James has no regrets as he sets off into the unknown, trying to make a name for himself as an illustrator in Paris. We've no idea uh, what happens. Well, fact, I, I know what happens, but you don't. Uh, and you'll, you'd have to wait to find out. But the most th the important thing about Edith Piaf is that, although she didn't know it at the time, is that her name is a wonderful acronym, a way of remembering what I think were the really important phases in the blended solution that she experienced. And you know, those were, in, in summary, first of all, a, a, a preparation in the, way, in, the, in the sense that the learner and the learning were properly aligned. So in other words, the, there were whatever preparation the learner had to do to take advantage of the learning took place, and that the learning was adjusted to suit the, you know, the learners who were coming on the program. And they did that job really well. So, and then there was, there was all sorts of input that uh, LeBeau provided to, to help uh, Nicole. Um, 
it wasn't so well provided to James, but input could be anything in, a, in any blended program from something as formal as a piece of e-learning or a classroom workshop to, to a, you know, a series of action learning group sessions or, uh, or coaching sessions or whatever it might be. But whatever input is needed to, uh, to achieve the objectives. But most importantly, there is an application of whatever that uh, has been gained from that input into the real working, uh, uh, real working life. In other words, it's not just a, a process of, of being stimulated with a new input, but you're actually putting it into practice. And then that is properly followed up uh, over time, over, you know, over a, the extended learning journey. And that this, this is essentially produces a, an end-to-end -end experience. So let's just quickly see how that looked for Nicole. So in Nicole's case, those are those four elements. So in terms of preparation, what happened? You know, that Nicole, you know, there's a questionnaire to identify her needs and that somebody called up to, uh, to help plan her program with her. She had videos, PDFs and other materials that she could read in advance. She met the other trainees in a Google Hangout. Then I was a really, uh, the proper preparation phase, but even before she started work. And then in that input phase, there were, you know, group sessions in which they explored scenarios, there were group discussions, and there were the opportunity for her to do further scenarios on her own. The, uh, the, in, in terms of applications, she had the three days working at the, with the manager at the Gatwick store, and then a six-month traineeship, or I said three months earlier, but, you know, it's just been doubled, <laughs> six months uh, traineeship in, in Paris. So there's a a really, really full and well thought out process of application. And finally, all sorts of things to make sure the learning journey continues. So there were podcasts and other resources, there was uh, a mentor for uh, Nicole, and ongoing networking with the, other uh, with the other trainees. Now this is not saying this is some uh, model induction program, this is just saying that this is a blend, which not only blends all lo in lots of different ways, it blends in terms of uh, media, it blends in terms of strategies, it blends in terms of uh, who, who Nicole is learning with at different stages in that blend. But uh, the most important is that it's an end-to-end -end, end -end experience, that it blends formal and informal. It, it, it blends into the real job environment. It's not just something which is artificially uh, placed as an event at the beginning, uh, you know, and that's the beginning and end of it. Let's compare that very quickly with James, and then I must shut up and pass on. Um, James's learning experience is a bit of a sorry Tory story here, but in terms of preparation, uh, well, he had to, he read the annual report. That must have been really interesting for him at that stage. All right, well, he sat next to one of the other operators, he, but he couldn't work out what was happening. You know, he had um, dense e-learning modules with unnecessary detail. He had a 50-question quiz and a three-hour PowerPoint presentation by the regional trainer. In other words, a whole load of information dumping, uh, which was impossible for him to cope with, given, uh, you know, where he was in, on his journey. App, so application, no problem. Work on your own. Get on with it. Um, follow up, he didn't stay to find out. He'd already left. So in a way, this is a sort of a, a, a classic bungling of the job of creating uh, an induction program for James. And the result is that he's fed up and off he goes, as you would be. Um, and I think that uh, I'm hoping that, uh, as, well, I know that as you, as you hear some examples of the blends that uh, you're going to hear about now at uh, PwC and m and you'll see how uh, it's possible in, uh, not, not in this fictitious Nicole and James world, but in the real world, to make end, to create end-to-end -end blends which uh, really bring about performance change in, uh, back on the job. And that's what we're going to be uh, hearing about now. So I'm going to uh, pass over to Sarah. As long as I don't fall okay. Right, they always say they never work with uh, children work with technology and that's always an interesting thing because often it goes wrong. So uh, my name's Sarah Linzel. I work as the Global Digital and Learning Strategies Leader for PwC. We're not m and <laughs> as I say. I'm doing really well on the technology front today. So uh, my job is to think about learning strategy and digital learning across 150 territories and we have 200,000 employees and we onboard a significant amount of people each year. And what I wanted to do was to bring it back up to the sort of strategy level. Wrong set of slides. Sorry. 
I've got this. They're not my slides. But anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on. I've got some slides here. I'll talk from these. So what I want to talk about, first of all, is the sort of strategy for learning at PwC. So we don't talk about events. We talk about experiences. And that's because blending has been part of something we have been doing for a long, long time. So when we talk about um, learning at PwC, we talk about events and experiences that are personalised to everybody's needs, that they fit around the shape of the work that the person is doing, that they are um, on 24-7, so that sort of martini vision of learning, you know, whenever, however, whoever, wherever you want to take it. And it's across multiple different <coughs> service lines. So our business is built up of many different service lines. Everything has to be flexible. It has to be scalable, if this works, yep. It has to be relevant, and it has to be done in the course of working. And everything we do at strategy level for l &E is anchored in the 70, the 20, and the 10. So I thought it would be quite interesting to highlight some of the trends that are affecting our learning strategy today. And these are probably no different to the trends that are affecting you in your organisation or indeed in m and We were talking earlier, although we're in completely different businesses, the trends are the same. So, you know, targets. Learning is key as our leaders want to grow our business at a phenomenal rate. We're sold out. Our utilisation rates for our staff are incredibly high. You might be working in a manufacturing industry. Your people might be out on the floor all the time. But, you know, the challenges are the same. Our attitudes towards learning are changing. You know, we have a tremendous amount of millennials coming through the workplace. And also, as education models change, in the industry and in school and in university, we're seeing some of those needs from people actually being reflected in how they want to learn in organisations. There's a big war for talent. I don't know about you, but I'm finding it incredibly hard to recruit the right type of staff for what I need. As a business, we're facing a real need for increased mobility. As a global business, we need to be able to shift people around borders there's a shortage of skills. And we're seeing our workforce changing. You know, no longer are people in jobs for life. They're moving around every 12, 18 months, 24 months. So you've got that constant churn. Increased growth, I've said before, and obviously being global is a big factor for us in our learning strategy. So why is blending really critical for us? It's critical because learning over time is what makes learning stick. It's like learning your times tables. You've got to learn them, relearn them, learn them. I'm learning them all over again as I'm helping my daughter with her homework. You know, it's the only way that we can really achieve our strategy. We want to get more bang for every buck. You know, these days you have got to make your training dollars or pounds work incredibly harder than they have at any other time. You're facing a period where you might have your training budgets baselined over a period of time, but you might be increasing your employees coming through the door. So how do you manage that gap? And I think blending is a key way to think about that. It's also the preference of our workforce. Our workforce are out on site. We really are a project-based organisation, so people are out at client sites an awful lot of the time. And blending and making learning available to them in 101 different ways is what enables them to access it when they need it and where they need it. And it also supports the five moments of learning need for us. And this is something you might well have seen before. Okay. So what's the strategy for blending in L&D? We design firstly for the 70. I'm sure some of you have got a 70-20-10 learning strategy. That's what runs throughout our organisation. So we design very much in the 70. Then we think about the 20 and maybe the 10. So we're really turning the way that we do it on its head. We define our toolbox up front, and I'll come to how we've mapped all of the technologies and different ways of blending across the 70 2010 later on. And we found it critical to establish a baseline of instructional design skills within our training organisation. We're a company who has been training forever. We have a workforce in our L&D department who might have a lot of traditional skills. So they might be really comfortable in front of a classroom, but they might not be so comfortable dealing with everything that's digital and how fast everything's moving today. So we want to train them to be able to blend. 
because it really is a skill. It's not just chucking everything in a blender and hoping it comes out right. And I often use that video of, um, you know, will it blend and the man putting the iPad in the blender. I think that's quite a good way of trying to talk to some leadership. It's not just about chucking everything in the pot and seeing what comes out. We also provide really good on-the-job support tools. So we have consulting quick reference guides for how you can go and talk to the business about how you blend. We have um, a high-level design template. So one of the things that we ask our designers to do is to actually come up with the blend and then they pitch it. And then we have time to go back to them and say, actually, you could do this in this way, you could introduce this, you could blend it in a different way. So we also evaluate and share all of our success stories. And I think implementation of what you have ever you do is really key. So if you think about blending, it's a mix of a whole different lot of things. It's all the different modalities that you've got to play with to get your learning objective across to the learner. So in the 70, it's around, you know, do people have the tools that they need, checklists, online help, quick reference guides. In the 20, are they getting the support? And in the 10, if their life depended on it, are you training them well enough to do the job? So if we look at the 10, we have got all these different modalities that we can actually choose from. So you can choose to blend self-studies, virtual classrooms, e-assessments. I hope you choose to blend them better than what we saw in Clive's story. You know, and there's also emerging things for us that are part of the blend as well. Serious gaming, tablets in the classroom, adaptive learning. In the 20, you've also got an enormous amount to play with that might not be what you traditionally think of in the 20. So social learning, you've got blogs, you've got wikis, we've got a social networking platform called Spark that we do quite a lot of social learning on. You know, and you've also got emerging technologies like e-coaching and e-mentoring, and you can think about how you can use all of those as part of your blend. And then in the 70, you have a whole load of different modalities here too that you can use. So shadowing, performance support, whether that's actually intrinsic as part of the application, or whether that's you know, along with job aids and things like that. So that sort of summarises really the whole modality mix for the blend that at PwC we use across all of designing our learning solutions. Okay. So choosing a blend though really is the designer's responsibility. So you come at it from the learner, what they feel, what they think, you know, the business problem that you've got to solve, moving forward to sort of the objective. So how do they need to be at the end of it? And you hold the, ha you hold the key to whether they're going to get there or not. So we think the characteristics of a really good blend for us is that it's personalised, it's relevant, just in time, and it allows time for reflection. So it allows time for the learning to sink in as they go through that journey. So as a designer that's blending, we then think, once they've got the blend, let's check for the effectiveness of that. So this is something that we use based around Bloom's taxonomy and interactivity levels. You know, you wouldn't choose to design a blend that was for a brain surgeon learning to do brain surgery via a checklist. That's just not going to be effective or efficient. You don't want to spend a whole load of money doing a massive great simulation for teaching somebody just a chunk of knowledge. So once we have our blend, we tend to check it for effectiveness and for efficiency. So this is one of the blends that I thought I'd briefly talk about. And this is um, a blend of having an informed conversation. And this is one of the things that we have done, one of our curriculum models, that we've used to train up l &E in how to have great conversations with the business. And so when we wanted to do that, somebody said, oh, let's put them all in a classroom. And we thought, oh, well, you know, really, we ought to be doing it in a digital way if they're actually coming into the digital age. So we have a virtual classroom here. You can see the icons down the side sort of reference whether it's um, a video, a simulation, um, an e-learning, and everything that we have is fully supported by social learning groups around all of this. So that's one of the um, example blends. And in actual fact, if you think about our whole strategy to how we go about blending, that's also a blend. The other one that you will see featured in Clive's book, 
more than blended learning, but I'll give a little plug for that, is our global brand curriculum. And what we did with this is a few years ago, PwC changed its branding. And it didn't only change the colours and the way that it looked, it changed the way that it spoke with its clients. It changed, it changed everything, from how you write, right the way through to how you deliver a, a report and how you engage with your clients. That was a major change for our organisation and it required a really big training effort. And when we looked at that, we really wanted to do it in many different ways. We had cultural issues, which meant that doing everything online wouldn't be acceptable. We also knew that we had to put a great implementation plan in place if we were get, going to get it to work effectively right the way across the globe from day one. So you can see up there, we did some PowerPoint template training because everything had changed the way that, that all the colours, we went from blue to a rainbow of colours that you can use. So you could have all of these different ways of looking at things. So we delivered that in e-learns and then we did virtual classrooms and we also put all of that in a support site and we set up a whole load of different learning groups through our social learning platform and then people were able to come in, ask, swap tips, hints and those <coughs> groups are really active today still. Our brand, our clients are new, which was a simulation and an e-learning that was also be able to be delivered via virtual classroom and also try in a classroom environment, if that's the way the territory wanted to implement it. Same with writing in the brand style. Really interesting, but we managed to train how you write and change the way people write doing a big simulation, which was a completely different way of getting it across. And the really interesting thing there we found was the fact that the results of that were actually going viral. So it had a plot line to it all the way through. And then you found out who Fact Trottle was at the end. And that whole thing we found going right the way through all of our social <coughs> learning sites that were supporting it. And again, writing reports, we did that in three different ways as well. We also wrapped this in the whole implementation of territory support groups, territory partners that were lead partners on making the brand work and stick at, at the um, territory level. And then we had all of our social learning groups helping brand workshops, brand helpline, so if I couldn't do something, I could put something in and have it critiqued by an expert. So there's many different ways of bl blending. I wanted to concentrate more on the strategy side because I know that um, Bridge is going to come along and give some great examples of what M&S have been doing. So I hope that's been useful and I look forward to your questions afterwards. I'm bound to have to write slides because this should be the last lot, hopefully. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Breed Nunn. I head up the retail L&D design team um, from Marks & Spencer. So we have over 600 stores in the UK. We have over 400 stores across our global franchise and international areas. And in amongst all that, we have over 100,000 staff. And I feel a massive weight sometimes on my shoulders about um, holding all the learning for those people in my hands and in my team's hands. So you can imagine some of the challenges that we have. We have many different sizes of stores. We have a huge amount of frontline customer assistants, 85,000 of them off the top of my head. Um, and the other uh, challenge that we have, and we're probably one of the few companies that have this challenge, is we could have uh, up to five generations working within our stores at any one time. And that's everything from Generation X, Y, Z, Millennials. We've got the whole pot. And that's because the nature of work within Marks & Spencer and the fact that our customer assistant group, mass group in stores, are, are one of our key frontline um, teams that, that work on the sales floor. Um, you can also imagine in a busy working store environment that accessibility to learning is really difficult. So you've got a busy working store, we're there to sell, we're there to serve the customer and we also have to make sure that our teams can learn correctly and in the right environment to be able to operate properly on the sales floor. So 
I'm hoping that the majority of you would at some stage have been actually in an m and which would be great if you were, um, and busily buying all the time. Um, so, how do we deploy learning in m and retail? Well, we have to use blended learning. We have no choice, really, based on the fact that our biggest challenge around cost is every time we take somebody off that sales floor to do any learning for them, we don't have them out there serving the customer. So we don't have, we can't just push the button and be able to get it out there. So in some cases, we have to take a great piece of learning in the UK and then we have to internationalize it, which means that we have to change the blend again. So this particular example is um, a men's suits piece of e-learning that we had. That's all about how you measure and fit a suit on a gentleman. We couldn't just deploy that. So in order to create the right blend for our international teams, we had to take the product um, and completely change the way it was delivered. So we slowed everything down because of the whole language barrier. We don't translate everything into across all of our countries because it's virtually impossible. Um, we had to make sure that the learning was embedded in the right way, bearing in mind that a lot of um, people across our international stores, English is not their first language. And that has an, ex an, extra, uh, an extra challenge, as I've said. Um, however, what we were able to do was show that it's not that difficult to be able to do it if you set it up in the right way. So we worked on editing some of the footage that we all had already filmed for the piece of e-learning. We, we recut that so that it worked for an international audience. We did it lots more in bite-sized chunks, so we broke it down with a slightly different blend of facilitation. And then we did our train the trainer by video conference. That in itself was a challenge, but we did manage to do it. And when you've got 30 stores over 25 regions in M&S across the world, and you're working from a head office in Paddington through, through a video conference, it can have its challenges, but we managed to do it. So it, again, it was a fantastic way of getting that product out without having to reinvent the wheel. So I suppose in summary, what I would say is that, I'll just click these up quickly. Blended learning absolutely works in a retail environment. There is no other way that we could do it across our stores. It's, it's virtually impossible. Um, from a cost efficiency for the business, we have our sales floor workforce, and then we have the whole time limitations. Um, we have our challenges around all of those different generations and how they operate. And we have to have classroom one-to-one, -one, blended, visual, iPads on the floor, all of that blend has to become really important for the learner. Um, and it has to be flexible and on demand. And if we give people access, we've realized that actually they will come and learn. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and I think, do I throw it open to the floor? I hand back to, to Sheena. Thank you very much. Could you state the biggest challenges uh, of blended learning for your companies? What is the most challenging in blended learning? Okay, do you, you want to go first? Um, I think for us, it's um, the challenge is getting the right blend. So I talked earlier on about having people who understand how to blend and that it's not just about putting whatever, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the next thing into a pot. 
really comes down to having, you know, it's, it's the basic stuff. It's having a really solid um, objective and then how you're going to get that through to implementation. And then picking the best modalities to deliver that depending upon your target audience, where they're located, you know, what sort of time they're going to have to spend on each individual element. So that's why we always start with making sure our objectives are absolutely solid and then we can break them down and do the modality piece against it. So I think the biggest challenge at the moment for us is making sure that all of our designers, wherever they are in the world, have an incredibly high level of skill with all of the different modalities and things that they've got to play with to enable them to create the best learning experiences. Um, I think our biggest challenge and I've already mentioned it probably, is about getting time for people on the sales floor to be able to um, learn in, in the right environment. That will always be our challenge. Um, and in a retailing environment where sales are important, we constantly juggle with trying to balance the needs of people on the sales floor versus the needs of our customers, as in the customers we sell to. So it's, it's a juggling act all the time. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking on behalf of a, a, of a major organisation, but just in talking to many, many different uh, learning professionals in different organisations, I, I would echo uh, what Sarah was saying: is the, the real problem is right at the beginning when the, uh, at the at the interaction between the learning professional and the client, your internal or external client, and the way that you handle that process and the consultation process, so that you come up with a design which is really going to uh, do the job uh, without wasting a lot of organisations' resources. And I think most, most learning professionals are, are just not experienced at blended design, and uh, we need to give them uh, quite a bit of help to make this transition, but uh, uh, you know, that's an investment well, that pays off uh, very quickly. Thank you very much. Have Thanks for the gentleman. Um, I'm interested to hear more about motivation to learn and perform and how that fits into the blend. For example, uh, Brid, you spoke about learners choosing to devote time to learning at home. Yeah. But are there two classes of citizen? I mean, is there a negative consequence for the people who choose not to do that? And Sarah, you, in the context of your 10%, you mentioned if their lives depended on it, but it all went rather fast. Um, and that's usually, I think, an argument for building motivation rather than knowledge and skill. Uh, but I couldn't see what strategies you were including in that to provide for that. So could you say some more about that? Okay, so um, the reason why we, I suppose, where we got to was a decision about whether we give people accessibility to e-learning at home. And yes, we encourage people to use it. There isn't a negative impact because if you don't, we have to work out a way that we can deliver that learning to you within the working day. But if you want to refresh or go back or, or even you know, look at some e-learning or DVDs in your own time, then the encouragement is there, the accessibility is there, but it's a total choice. And no, there is no penalization if you don't do it. Actually, it's just encouraged that if it suits you and you want to learn in that way, then the door is open to you to do that. But equally, if we have to get you through a programme through the day-to-day -day running of the business, we'll equally do that. Yeah. Does that answer your question okay? I think motivation is a key part of, what, of anyone wanting to learn. So for me, one of the big things that I'm always challenging people on is relevance. And that's why I'm really hard on the objective side of things. Because if you're asking me to learn something for my job, it's really got to be relevant to me in that exact moment that I need it, versus doing it just in time, because I might need it six, 12 months later, by which time I might well have forgotten about it. So the way we've turned things on our head a little bit more is to say to people, to just to try and change the game up, you know, think about what you can do in the 70, first of all, then think about the 10, uh, the 20, and then the 10. Maybe you do need some sort of formal training for it, but you have to really make sure that it's absolutely relevant. And one of the things we use is, you know, if you're saying to me that you want to do something in the 10, then, 
you know, what are they going to do? Are they actually, if you're going to put a gun to their head, will they be able to do what you're training them for? So it's just, it's a bit of a quip of what we use just to make a conversation work. But I really do agree with you. I think motivation is absolutely key. But that comes down to relevance. And, and if you're going to blend it, making it really exciting for the person. So it's not just about breaking it down into component parts, but what's the thing that's going to hook them right the way through? You know, very much like a soap opera, you know, at the end of EastEnders, duh, 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 you've got some sort of hook at the end that's going to draw you back into the next episode. I think about learning like that. So in a blend, what's the hook? What's going to take them right the way through the entire programme and give them the motivation to get to the end? Does that answer your question? We can pick up afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, can I just, yeah, I'd ask, uh, well, oh, and thank you for explaining that, by the way. Um, in one of your slides, you have choosing a blend, um, the designer's responsibility, and I just wondered what the whole panel's opinion then is on what's your, or what's your view on the learner taking responsibility and choosing their own blend to drive their own learning? I, I'm all for that, right? So I think part of what we do we might have only one path through something, so it might be a blend that um, you know starts and finishes because it might have a regulatory piece of learning in it, there might be a compliance piece to it. But then I'm also a fan of um, making blends that learners are able to personalise their way through. So just recently, we are just about to complete um, tutor and facilitation skills. And we've taken a three-day classroom course and we have broken that down and we've created a big blend for it and the majority of it is out of the classroom. So they're going to learn all about tutor and facilitation skills outside of the classroom and then they're coming together for like half a day to do the practice element of it. So we've really taken that. And there's multiple different learner paths that you can take through that bank of content depending on where you are and what needs you have at a particular time. So I think personalisation in blending is really fantastic, and if you can offer that, I think that takes it to a whole next level. Yeah, I'd probably say we're, we're definitely not in Marks & Spencer retail um, at the point where we can offer personalised mm -hmm. learning, um, purely with the numbers of people that we have. Um, however, having said that, the way we would try and do it is that we might have two or three key pieces in any, in any learning intervention that we've got, and then we'll do the add-ons. If you want to know more, then you can go and look here. If you want a summary, then please look here. If you want to start at the beginning and do the whole lot, then go to this piece of e-learning or this film clip or whatever it is. So I suppose we do a bit of a learning journey summary for them with extra stuff that they can, they can look at and, and find out for themselves um, if they so choose to do that. But the crux of what we have to get through will be in the kind of two or three key pieces that are part of the bigger journey. Yeah, I'd just like to, uh, to uh, endorse the fact that I think blend blending uh, can come, I feel like, on a bottom-up basis as well as top-down. So I agree with you, but I still think as uh, learning professionals we have a role to play here, not only perhaps in sometimes providing the resources that people choose from, but also in making it easier for learners to make informed and sensible choices, so uh, things like diagnostic questionnaires and what have you, and, and, and a, a, a process of curation in, in uh, pointing people towards uh, content or people that are going to be really valuable to them. So I don't think we can just say, here's a load of stuff, go, go get it. Uh, maybe we can with more experience, uh, but with uh, but with novices, we still have quite a responsibility mm. to give them help. So they don't necessarily know what they don't know. They don't necessarily know what the best way might be of, of, of reaching that goal. So there's still quite a big role for us. So we've got time for another couple of questions. So let's get some hands up. Would you like to go ahead and ask a question, lady at the front? Yeah. I'm making you work for it, you see. <laughs> 
Thank you. I enjoyed all three presentations. Thank you very much. I'm particularly interested in the MS cultural shift that you made. You said you had 70% classroom learning initially, and you moved that right down to 20%. Clearly, that wasn't just through inspirational, creative, blended learning resources. There must have been some um, mindset shifts and winning hearts and minds. How did you work with the business units and the senior leadership teams in particular to achieve that? A huge amount of influencing, if I'm totally honest, and the fact that in a cost-effective environment that we are in, um, we had to make some choices, and the fact that trying to manoeuvre people around the UK, for example, to go to one place to then have a learning intervention in a workshop environment is not cost-effective for us. It really isn't. And the less of that we can do, the more that we can then spend on making some of the products that we have really impactful for the learner. And we, we, we had to stop that. We had no choice um, because of the cost, the travel, the coming out of a store, the impact on the store operationally. It, it just wasn't going to work, particularly around managers. So if we've got 600 stores, we probably have 15,000 managers at different levels across those stores. And we, we just couldn't do it any longer. It was pure um, cost. However, once you set your strategy out, and once we'd got to the point where we knew that we were going to move to a much more blended way, people did embrace that. Um, it took a while. It wasn't overnight. So if I say that I've been in that team for five years, we, we were in what, a very different place five years ago, and we're moving to an even more exciting time now if we can get our technology right for people out in stores. But it's, it's, it's got to shift that way from a cost effectiveness, and the business had to support that. I, I mean, I echo that, and I think how, the more you can do to influence your leadership, or whoever is paying the bills or whatever it is in your organisation, those conversations and getting the support of the leadership on site is absolutely <coughs> critical, both from a you know, continuation of training budgets or whatever, but also in preparing people um, to support them when they're on the job. So it's not just about making sure that you know, leadership are on board with the approach you're taking, but it's also about training leaders back in the business to help them support the person as they go through their learning journey. So I think that's yeah. quite critical. We've got time for one more. That, that was a quick hand up. We'll go with you. <laughs> Hi, just a question based on Bree's presentation. How are you measuring the impact of your, of your learning? So what, how do you know what has got better from the learning? Well, the way we do that, we have got regional um, learning and development consultants. So we work, they work directly. They're, if you like, my, my eyes and ears out in the field. So we have a field team who are our eyes and ears. Um, and that would, they would work closely with the head of region business partners, HR business partners in each of those regions to understand the impact. We do a full PIO when it's a, a big uh, business concept that we're rolling out or a program. Um, and the other way we can track is through um, our uh, Moodle system. So we can see how well the learning has been embedded by some key questions in there. And obviously critical in all of this is how we go back to the line manager and see whether they've actually seen a difference in somebody who is now operating, hopefully, at a different level back on the sales floor. So we try and complete the, this, the cycle, if you like. It's not easy, but we do try and do it. OK. Well, thank you very much for coming along and uh, being part of this first session on Track 2. My huge thanks to our speakers. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much.